What up? Hi. Oh, the Ooh. lights are so bright. Yeah, they're bright. Okay. Like your future, Elaine. Like my future. Yeah. Yes. All right. Do you want to oh, get started? Welcome to welcome the to May. I was going to say September, but yeah. Or June, yeah. almost. Yes. Who knows? Who knows which month it is? We're in a vortex because we uh, just got back from a very romantic trip to Portugal, know, the two together. of us. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, yeah. Welcome to Papers We Love. I'm Elaine. This is Inez. Um, we uh, have a couple of announcements before we start. So, if you... Uh, it, has anyone here not been to Papers We Love before? Oh, oh yeah. Thank you so awesome. much. Welcome. Yeah, for coming. Uh, so, uh, in terms of structure for today, we're going to do a mini, which is like 15 to 20 minutes. Then we'll take a quick break. We'll come back for the main talk, which will be about 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, but before that, a couple of things. So, if you are familiar or are not familiar with Papers We Love, uh, we are an organization that um, celebrates academic papers and the intersection of industry and academia. Uh, we also put on a conference every year uh, during slash before Strange Loop in St. Louis. And this year, the conference is taking place on September 26th. Um, so you can buy tickets online for that. We are also always looking for new speakers. So we have a form um, that we normally tweet out. So look out for that online. Uh, and if you want to talk, come talk to us. Yeah, and if you need help preparing your talk or just like doing dry runs and everything, we're here to help you too. All right, so are we going to get started? Anything else we All right. cover? Uh, I don't think we have anything else. We are going to announce the next dates soon. Yeah, and we're live streaming this. Um, yeah. So if your friends want to watch, they can do that. It's live-stream.github.com. All right, so let's get going. So for our mini, uh, normally what happens is like I grab the bio of a speaker, I made a few edits, I add something fake, and then I'll tell it to you. So let's go. Ori. Ori was once lovingly evicted from the womb. The experience was unpleasant, and he has never forgiven the world for it. Today, he spends most of his time waving fingers over keyboards in order to inject magic into microwaves. Ori once ate the filling from an entire package of Oreos and put it back for somebody else to find. Yeah, let's give it up to oh, like for Ori. Cool. So I'm here to talk about the slab allocator, an object caching memory allocator. Um, initially presented by Jeff Bonwick uh, while he was working for Sun Microsystems in 1994. Um, and it's presented by me, someone not that important. Um, so what is it? It was the kernel memory allocator for Sun OS 5.4. Um, and that's where it made its debut. It's an object caching allocator. I'll go into more detail about what that actually means very, very soon. And it is a head-smackingly simple design. So I'm, that is why this is in papers we love, because it is so simple, I don't know how I could not love it. Um, I look at it and go, well, why would you do it any other way? And at the same time, obviously, it took until 1994 before this simple, brilliant idea actually ended up hitting production. So there is something to it. And the paper itself is a great presentation with measurements, clear descriptions, and it's just a delight to read. So I suggest you read it if you haven't already. Um, OK. So it's also widely applicable. It's used in a whole bunch of kernels. So Linux actually has three variants of it. It has the slab allocator, which is you know basically the slab allocator, slub, which is the slab allocator with tweaks. And it's got something kind of like it, but not quite, which is uh, the slob allocator, um, which is basically a block of a, a list of blocks. It's got it's in FreeBSD kind of as UMEM. It's in Solaris and Glib. If you're using any GTK stuff, actually has it. And on top of that, it's got um, it's in a few other allocators that are uh, kind of partially implemented without all of the object caching features. So, for example, JMalloc. Actually, J. Malik should probably be at the bottom of the list because it's the least inspired. Um, but T. C. Malik is very clearly heavily in, um, influenced by this. And then I've written a couple of allocators that uh, use this kind of uh, approach as well. So it's a very widely applicable design. So what is it? <laughs> so 
the slab allocator came out of two uh, observations. First off, reinitialization of objects is slow. That's the, that's the object caching part of it. Um, basically, if you're allocating something, it'll take maybe a few microseconds to get the memory, and then another few tens of microseconds to initialize it, you know, set up the mutexes, uh, copy over the initial values, compute whatever you're putting into it, things like that. So that's, so that kind of motivates the object caching side of things. And then the second observation is that we allocate a lot of the same things. Most of the allocations you make are of a single type or a small set of types. Um, you'll have, you know, hundreds of thousands of uh, integers allocated or tens of thousands of, uh, um, what am I thinking of? Uh, buffer heads for uh, files or whatever else. Um, so there are two solutions. Reinitializing is expensive. So what if we just don't reinitialize? It's kind of obvious if you think about it. This is expensive. So let's not. And then the other one is what if we set things up in the allocator so that instead of trying to be super general, we optimize for allocating lots of blocks of the same size. Okay, so far I hope everything is making sense about this because there's nothing complicated here. So, as I said, construction and destruction is expensive. So let's not. Keep things around until we allocate memory, or until we need memory. Um, and when we don't need the memory, any, or, and when we're tight on memory, we can reclaim large chunks of objects at once. Um, allocate in batches. So. When we allocate, we grab a whole bunch of memory, initialize the objects in it all at once, and then hand them out as needed and recycle them. And then we also deallocate in matches just because that's kind of how it works practically. If you can, if you allocate, sorry, if you deallocate it eagerly, well, you haven't saved anything because now you're reallocating and deallocating and allocating and deallocating and you get the idea. And yeah, reuse what you can. So. The API that you came, you come up with when you think about it this way is, well, this. You have your uh, KMM cache create, which creates a allocator for a specific type of object. Uh, you give it a name so that you can kind, you can um, refer to the allocator um, or debug or whatever else. The size of the object. So, um, if you're doing malloc, you you'd be familiar with passing in the size. This basically puts it up front into when you create the allocator. So, and then you have the alignment because this is a kernel and we care about that kind of thing. Um, if you're in user space, you just kind of always get aligned blocks and no one cares. Um, and then you have the constructor, which the allocator calls to up front to allocate the block to the, the objects and the destructor, which obviously deallocates them. Okay, so KMM cache create. That's basically create an allocator. Then you can ask the allocator for an object. You pass it the cache, you give it the flags. You have the free, which takes the cache and the flag and the buffer that you allocated. And then destroy, which basically uh, says, hey, I'm done with this. Can you free all the memory that I was using? tear everything down, and I'm not allocating any more of these objects. Simple API, easy to use, nothing crazy here. Allocation, uh, if, it, if the object is cached, take it. You don't need to construct anything. Otherwise, allocate memory, construct the object, re return it. Freeing. Insert into cache. That's, that's it. That's all you need to do. And to reclaim, which basically means we're, we're tight on memory, I, give me back a bit. Uh, then you destroy the objects in the cache, basically call the destructor callback on it. Drain the cache, which means, you know, free this memory back to the system and return it to the system. Um, I guess those two are kind of the same thing. Um, okay, so you, but why do you need a special allocator for this? This is... Uh, 
something that you can do just as a layer on top of your allocator, right? Just keep a linked list of things around or whatever. Well, there are a few reasons that you want to do it this way. First off, the central allocator allows you to have smarter reclaim and have a global idea of what's, uh, what the memory pressure is, uh, and you can kind of call out to the ones with the most uh, slack. Um, you can add in hooks for debugging features that share code, um, and you can just reuse code. So I believe that the paper says that when uh, this was implemented in Solaris, it reduced the code size by something like 3,000 lines and probably fixed a bunch of bugs. <laughs> okay, so that's the object caching part of it. But what about the actual slab allocation, which should be slab allocation? Okay. Um, so it's basically a linked list of linked lists. Um, so that's, this is the slab allocation part of it. You have a linked list of chunks inside a slab. And each slab is on a linked list. So, taking an ob so allocating basically means you look at the head of the list and that gives you the slab. You pop the first element off of the slab and you're done allocating. So, the general uh, logical overview of this is you have your KMEM slab. So that's your kernel memory slab. Um, and that points to the buffer control. So that basically stores data about free, uh, in free uh, data in the slab. Um, it points to the next one, and it points to the data. It points to, and then the next one points to the next one and points to the data. Um, the data has a bunch of buffers in it. And some unused slack at the end, which is used for performance. Um, I'm sure everyone's heard of cache lines. So if you have a little bit of unused data here, you can do something called cache coloring. That means that if you have something that falls into one cache bucket, you can shift it a little bit so that um, if you have another slab, you can, it doesn't conflict with the same cache lines as, your, as the thing you just allocated. So now you kind of have a little bit of spread across cache lines and you're not hitting the same one every time. Um, I'm not going to go into too much more depth on that, but that's a general idea. So as I said, this is the logical uh, layout. Uh, this is the diagram from the paper. Uh, and this is kind of going over again what we were talking about with the uh, growing and, heap and reaping of the um, large number of slabs, returning memory to the system, and then having the front end, which will uh, basically hand out the specific objects that you ask for. OK. So what happens here? You call KMM cache alloc, and it asks for more memory. It uses KMM cache grow to get that memory from the rest of the system, um, probably using something like a more traditional buddy system allocator. Um, KMM cache free will put things back into the cache. You have a reference count on the, um, um, the KMM slab. So if it's fully unused, you can return all the memory to the system. OK. So let's actually walk through what happens when you allocate something. So this basically describe this will show a, um, or this is showing a, an empty slab, or empty slab allocator. You have your object cache, which has a head pointing to null, an initialization function, so your constructor, and your free function, which deinitializes it. OK, so you want to allocate something. Let's allocate something. We create a new slab, and that slab has its tracking information packed in at the head, at the head of it. So we've moved from the logical layout where you have everything linked together and not necessarily laid out together to uh, the more physical layout where you would have all of the uh, slab tracking information packed into a single um, slab. Um, the next slab and previous slab pointers are null because, well, 
you've only got one slab, there's nothing else on the linked list. And you've got the head of the free list. This is actually pointing to your chunks. So if you follow the free list, you see you've got the first chunk, then the next chunk, then the next chunk, then the next chunk. Um, you'll have however many chunks in your slab as you would have in, as you can fit with some slack at the end to do the coloring that I mentioned. Okay, so now we've got a slab. Let's take something out of it. Pop the first element of the uh, free list, and now you've got an allocated object. You return that back to the caller, and you're pointing to the uh, second chunk, and the second chunk is pointing to the third one. Now let's just say that you've allocated everything in the uh, slab. I've actually realized I've got a mistake here because you actually don't need to keep track of slabs that are completely free. Uh, you can drop them from a f the free list. If you want to put them back in, you, fr you look at the uh, slab when you, when you free the object, you compute the head of the slab, and you can kind of go back to, you can jump back to the start of the, it and go and insert back into the free head. You can, and then you can put the uh, slab back onto the start of the free list. Okay, so now what you'd want to do, but you want to allocate more, just add another slab onto the free list chunks and you can keep on chaining more slabs onto it as you go. Okay, so that's basically the slab allocator. Beautifully simple idea, not too much to the implementation. So, as I said, I've actually implemented a couple of them. I've attached the simplest one here. Um, and this thing is not, it's cutting off the start of it. So, oh well, I think you'll have to do without the first character of the uh, <laughs> C file. <laughs> okay, so what I'm just, what I've got here is a working uh, slab allocator implementation. And I'm basically describing, so this is actually slightly more general and doesn't do the object caching. Um, it would implement the same inf interface you would want for uh, malloc. Uh, up front, I define the types that you uh, need. So you've got the bucket size. That's uh, basically how big a slab is. Uh, sorry, how many, how big the maximum bucket is. Uh, the slab size, which basically means I'm going for eight megabyte slabs in this one. It's kind of huge. Um, if I was doing it again, I would much smaller slabs because it turns out that there's a lot of overhead in initializing the linked lists. And as a practical matter, you don't want to spend milliseconds putting together, you know, every, you don't want every... 10 millionth allocation to take 10 milliseconds. That kind of sucks. So there's a bit of uh, balance in keeping the uh, allocation times relatively bounded. Uh, the alignment is 16 bytes because that's the max, or the maximum alignment of a type that you will need on the x86 ABI. Um, specifically, if you are trying to allocate uh, XMM vectors, those will need to be uh, 16 byte aligned. Otherwise, you will get program crashes when you try to load them up and do stuff with them. And then you want to have a little bit of uh, hysteresis around things before you return uh, uh, memory to the system, because otherwise you end up just bouncing back and forth uh, and mapping and flushing your TLB, which kills performance. So here's the bucket struct. The bucket is basically... Uh, you can think of it that as a single slab cache. Um, for a more for the kind of general uh, malloc uh, API, you'll have a bucket for each size class, and you'll pick the uh, size class that you're allocating from. Um, for the if you're implementing to paper, you'll just have one of these, and this is your uh, allocator or your cache. Um, but I have a bucket. Okay. So you so your bucket has the size, the number of uh, elements per slabs for easier initialization, the head of the linked list of slabs, and the cache I mentioned just to avoid hysteresis, um, and a mutex to prevent other threads from killing things. 
Okay. Uh, your chunk is basically the slab chunk that you're returning to the user. Um, and you basically, or what I do is I basically overwrite the, uh, when it's free, it's a slab chunk. You use that to track the linked list. When it's allocated, you just return the entire piece of data to the user. And there's actually no per allocation overhead to, uh, that you need to track if you know the size. Okay. So allocating the, so creating a slab. Um, if the bucket cache, if the bucket has something in the cache, we can just return the slab. This is, we don't need to reinitialize it. Otherwise, we ask the system for some more memory. Uh, we align the um, start of the slab to the alignment that we need. Initialize the uh, slab counters and so on. And initialize each chunk in there so you have the full linked list. Um, allocating from a bucket basically takes the chunk. You start off with the first element in the slab. If there's no slab, create a new slab, put it in. Then grab the uh, first element from the free head, set the free head to the next element, decrement the reference count so that you know whether you need it. If you have, if the uh, slab is fully empty, uh, or if, sorry, fully used, uh, then you can just, just stop tracking it so you don't walk through the linked list. And return the uh, data that you grabbed. Okay. The uh, freeing uh, a bit of memory, you take the chunk that you want, or sorry, yeah, chunk that you want, uh, get the head of the slab from the pointer. So because the slabs are allocated and aligned uh, in, in an aligned fashion, so power of two alignment, you can drop the, the bottom bits of it and now you have the head of the slab and you can uh, well, manipulate it from there. If, there's, if the slab was fully uh, allocated and wasn't being tracked in the linked list, you put it back onto the bucket slab list. And now you've got a fresh bucket, which is with nice warm cache. <laughs> so you can allocate from that. Um, otherwise, you, if, you've got, if you wanna keep it in the cache and it's, sorry, if the bucket is completely free, you can, you can choose to return it to the system at this point, uh, or you can keep it around to prevent, uh, so that you have, you're not bouncing back to, mal or to MMAP every time. Increment the number of free uh, items in the um, slab, set the uh, free head to the thing you just uh, released, and you're done. That's your allocating free. Cool, so slab allocator for you. Are there any questions? <laughs> what are you caching on? Just the size of the thing being allocated or? Yeah, so in the case of the uh, um, API used by the kernel, um, in, as in, what you would actually be doing is um, creating a new allocator for the specific type. So actually, just put in some. So what you would do would be something like, um, well, every, every size of block every, that you every allocate type gets that its you're own, allocating. every type gets its own allocator. Yes. So you do something along the lines of this. Okay. So if that makes sense. What do you use for your diagrams? Uh, <laughs> ASCII. Um, if you're wondering what the editor is, I'm using uh, Acme, which is kind of from the Plan 9 world. Um, I'll be rambling about that at Bay Lisa sometime later. But, yeah. I have a question. Um, what isn't this good for? What kind of workload? It's a 25-year-old allocator. 
EC Malik is more complicated than this. What is this for? Okay. So this one is very simplistic. Um, there are a few places where it will fall flat on its face. First off, if you're allocating lots of big things, you're going to be, obviously it's not going to fit into a slab, um, and you'll need to fall back to the system allocator, which if it's a buddy system allocator, it can be kind of slow. Uh, this simplistic version actually doesn't talk, talk much about um, what, how, what, how to deal with threads. So you might notice that uh, there's a lock on every allocation. Um, if you're in a multi-threaded system, this is bad. If you're in a multi-threaded system, this can be very bad. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, if you're on a single-threaded system, you don't need the lock. <laughs> so um, there's actually a paper from 2001 by the same author who, uh, where he actually solves this problem by basically taking a uh, per-thread cache, and then you've got a whole bunch of queues that have to, to do to deal with uh, cross-thread deallocation because now you can't just assume you've got a... If you take an object pass it to another thread, and then free it in that other thread. You still need to deal with contention, but you need you want to do it in some way that doesn't need you to take a lock on every allocation. Uh, so there's a lot more complexity that you need to add if you want to make this perform well with threads. Um, I actually benchmarked the uh, super simple slab allocator that I had. In the good case, it turned out to run something like... Um, 40% faster than uh, JE malloc, um, and something a little bit, so I'm trying to remember the numbers, uh, something like 30% faster than PT malloc, which is the glibc malloc. Um, so the super simple slab allocator in a single threaded workload is, notice, is measurably faster than what you will do for uh, uh, than what uh, current best of the best of the um, breed allocators will do, but as soon as you introduce multiple threads, it ends up being something like uh, three to five times slower. And then once you add big allocations into the mix, it ends up being, depending on the caching behavior, up to a thousand times slower. Um, then. There are a couple of other cases where it doesn't handle very well. So as I said, the initial assumption is that you're going to be allocating a lot of the same size objects. If you allocate a lot of different size objects, you end up with a lot of slabs that are mostly empty. OK, so uh, you're going to be around after the main talk, right? So if anybody has follow-up questions, they can find you there. Yep, and I believe we go to a bar, so I'll be there too. Yes, cool. So we're going to take a two-minute break. If you need the restrooms, they're over there, and Scott is going to set up. And you can refresh your drink. Yes, and food. Thank you. <laughs> Among other things, Scott Books is the author of Theft, a property-based testing library for C. He works on the compiler engineering team at Fastly, where he helps make fast things safe and save things fast. He's previously worked on embedded systems compiler, distributed storage systems, and architectural design software, but has always built testing tools along the way. Outside of computers, Scott loves cooking, bicycling, and electronics. Scott's proudest moment was when the Unicode Forum approved, approved his submission for the pierogi emoji. He has also eaten over two kilograms of Vegemite and carries a travel-sized tube of it whenever he goes. Let's give it up for Scott. So I didn't actually read Early's paper till early this year. I've been reading a bunch of stuff related to early parsers over the last several years, um, but mostly secondary sources or things that were summarizing other approaches that built on it. But I was surprised how accessible a paper it is. It's about nine pages, and it starts out with a nice conceptual summary of everything and some definitions, and then a couple of carefully chosen examples and recommended use cases. And it was summarizing his PhD thesis from 1968, August of 1968. So it's turning 50 years old this year. When it was written, the ink had barely dried on a bunch of other parsing stuff that we think of now as being fundamental. 
And everything at CITES was published just a couple of years before, and the paper has some core insights to it that wound up leading to a fundamentally new approach. So uh, I'm going to cover a lot. I'm going to talk first a bit about parsing, because I don't really expect that you'll have context for that, and then talk about the paper itself, and a little bit about a couple other things that came afterward that build on it in importance. So uh, parsing is a big field Computer science, it's big in the same, I'm sorry? Okay. Okay, there will be more. <laughs> so, so parsing is just, it's a big field in computer science. It's maybe not that clear how big it is from the outside, but it's big, like type systems are big, like, you know, lots of other things are big. This is a really, really quick intro to just defining a couple of terms that will come up over and over again. So, some context but hopefully enough to appreciate the paper. So parser is something that reads in, tries to recover some sort of structure to it. So anytime you've looked at data that's in a particular form, whether it was compiling code, getting a program, or possibly just some sort of uh, syntax error, curly braces and strings and stuff being turned into of JSON objects, just loading images, you are using something that's implementing parser in some way or another. And particularly if it's like a file loader for or something like that, it may or may not necessarily be recognizable as a parser compared to the sort of parser that might be in a compiler, but conceptually there's very similar things going on. And so a parser is traditionally one of the earlier phases in a compiler. So good to know about just on its own, because if you understand parsing, you can make tools that stuff and tell you what references what, or take something that's in kind of an awkward form, structures it so it's easier to work with, and also try to detect certain kinds of duplication that you can. And if what matches generally get is called a parse tree. So uh, it's similar to diagramming sentences for stuff in school. This sentence, the dreamer is still asleep uh, you'll see that there's an S at the top, sentence. There's two branches on there, which are NP and VP, and verb. Beneath those, there's the article, uh, the noun, dream, verb is, the adverb still, and the adjective, sleep. And if you've heard of an abstract syntax tree programming, that's closely related to a parse tree, but usually there's a pass that sort of cleans up some artifacts from parsing. And individual input tokens that go in terminals. Otherwise, with trees, it would just be called leads. But terminals is very established within parsing stuff. Terminals, different just of the parse tree. Similarly, you might have guessed this. Their uh, branches are called non-terminals. And these are all the layers of metadata that go on top. So here's a parse tree for arithmetic expressions. It just has one plus two plus three. And there's a couple of nodes there that say expression. For the sake of this, an expression is either or it's another expression and an operator. This is binding tighter to the left. So it's actually one plus two plus three. It also bind to the right. So then we'd have one plus two plus three. And that would depend on the grammar and the parsing approach that's being used. Maybe it's inherently ambiguous in the grammar. Maybe that's fine. It just really depends on the tooling that you're using. And while a parser generally works on an input string, usually there's a first separate pass that's called a tokenizer parser. What's that do what that's doing is taking the raw character input saying, oh, this looks like a number, this looks like an identifier, a very string, et cetera, et cetera, and just breaking it up in chunks and applying some sort of categorization onto it, part of speech. And uh, this is usually just done with regular expressions. They can't be used for full parsing because they don't have a stack. So if you have a nested node, you can't pop the stack and pick up it off. Next depth. Just a regular 
<clears throat> but it works very, very well as a first pass to an answer. And so a couple of terminals here. It's variable, and the variable name is gear ratio. It's an integer, and it's some number in hexadecimal. It's the string, which is the word sleep. And there's just a comma that doesn't have any sort of data associated with it. And so the parser will just get a stream of these, try to build up some sort of structure based on it. And each non-terminal has one or more reductions, which are sort of rewrite rules or matching rules for expression. In this case, is an expression operator expression, or it's an int, or it's a variable. It's some parentheses surrounding another expression. And sometimes you'll see that written now, now like this or something. It's emphasizing that on terminal has all of these as different alternative options. And also the, the um, name production emphasizes how historically in linguistics these were thought of as a way of a particular language rather than matching input. But it's it's a good example of notation that works really well. And if you group a bunch of these together, then you have a grammar. And so the little example grammar that I'm going to use throughout the talk, plus I specifically mentioned something else, will just be this. It's small, it fits on a slide, but it also has a couple of structural issues that will be some interesting places. And there's also a um, common convention in grammars talking about parsing and so on, where non-terminals are uppercase and terminals are lowercase. It's not a universal thing, but it's pretty common. And every grammar has a start symbol, which is just the starting place if you're matching or generating stuff. And if it's if it's not explicit, it's usually the first thing. Something named start. It's clear enough text. So to wrap all that up, we have a grammar, and then it has a non-terminal expression, which has a couple of productions, and parse tree. And there's a just about done with this part. And there's a variety of parsing algorithms. Um, two that are in common use that are sort of representative of several things are LL and R. These are sometimes referred uh, L and R in this case means leftmost and rightmost derivation as it's building things up. But um, one way that you'll often hear these described is top down and bottom up. So intuitively, LL parser is starting at the top from the start symbol, looking at the token stream and trying to build up structure supports the start symbol, whereas LR is starting from the terminals, chunking things up, and trying to grow the direction of the start symbol. And if you've used Yak or Bison, that uses LR-based variants. That's, that's a fairly common tool that people use for certain things. And an important consequence of those working either top up or bottom down is that they struggle with revision at the side that they're working from. So if you have LL parser and a production that has left recursion in it, so there's an expression, and the first thing an expression has is another expression, that'll actually cause it to go in. It's to be able to make some progress before it starts building things. Similarly, something that's working rightmost derivation if the last thing there is expression then stuck. And paper's title refers to a context free text means in that case is that aside from syntax uh, in the grammar, it needs global variables of some sort to decide some things. So C syntax is ambiguous because you can't really tell if something is a type name or identifier without carrying along a set of all of the types that have been so far, it's, it's actually in that way. And the emphasis on context-free grammars means that I'm talking mostly about and structured forms and things like that, rather than, say, human languages like French or Mandarin or Jin or ESL. Um, that is called natural language processing. It has very, very different trade-offs. It's kind of the difference between parsing C++ or parsing people tweeting about C++. And it's, it's a lot of fun to dabble in, but it's, it's way outside the scope of this talk.
So um, uh, before I move on to the paper, questions? Is everybody with me so far? Back? Okay, uh, people watching on YouTube? Okay, cool. So, And I'm talking here about Early's paper 1970. There are two papers that have this same title. Uh, the first one is his PhD thesis from 1968. That's about 140 pages. It has a lot of math proofs in it. This is a version of the paper that was written for a more popular audience. It was in editions of the ACM. It's about nine pages. Um, but there's several cases where he says, you know, and if you want to read, you can do this particular thing. Uh, these time constraints or things like that that you just read the full thesis. And one of the things I really like about the paper is that it starts up front intuitive explanation about how it works. I'm not one of those people where if the paper just immediately jumps into a mathematical presentation of stuff, necessarily get any insight about what it means based purely off understand it by some other means, then that can be like this way to sort of continue site afterward, but uh, right out of the gate, he has a couple definitions and says, here's a simple overview of about how the whole thing fits together. So the main structure in an early answer is called a state, and it represents a match in progress or part in progress. There's a non-terminal name, a production, and there's a dot in it somewhere. So to, to zoom in on the third state that's on the previous slide, the head there, there's a T. It's trying to match a T. And in the middle, in order to match that, it needs to match another T by an asterisk follow. Zero there means that it's trying to start matching that from position zero. In the, so this is at the very beginning. Dot is after the T. Asterisk, so it's already matched a T. Next thing it's looking for is an asterisk. As the state matches stuff, that dot will just step along, and when it gets to the end, it means that it's matched one of those, and then it can try to find something else that was waiting for so that. And so Parser has a table, a bunch of sets of states like this, just to represent all of the different things that it was trying to match at a particular time based on the input so far. State set zero is at the start of the input. State set one is after the first input token and so on. And because it's working with a set of these, it means that it can actually try several different approaches in parallel. So it doesn't add any duplicate states here, which cuts down on a lot of redundant. It's a good example of dynamic operation. The very first state starts with a special state, which is just the first thing we're trying to do is match the whole. So if that succeeds, then it succeeded. Um, I don't know why that this why this uses a that, but it's the notation that it uses in the paper. So as it runs, it has three operations that just run in a loop, it's running them until they don't make progress onto the next token. So I grow hop vines. One of the things about them that fascinates me is how they will sort of spread about and climb on structures and find really good vines. And if they find a support, they wrap around it and then shoot out more vines just to gradually spread over things. Ones that don't, that just sort of hang out into space, will eventually sort of bend under their own weight. That ends. So there's not any sort of central intelligence going on there. It's just sort of like a bunch of little feedback loops. But at the same time, they're covering stuff, lots of sun and so on. And the way that the early parser runs has that same sort of organic feel to it, where it's just spreading out, searching for a So again, these three operations are the scanner and the Victor looks for states that have a dot before the non-terminal. And it says, okay, so there's a dot before 
let's try also matching in by all the ways that we know how. And it adds those, and then they have a dot before the first thing because it's at the very beginning. So that way, we'll uh, try also to match any other thing that it needs to. Similarly, if the dot is before a terminal, matches the current input terminal, then next state set, it adds a copy of that state, but with the dot moved on. So uh, if it's able to match the next terminal that's in that state, then it just sort of advances. But it doesn't modify the current state, because that current state might also be used for after that. Peter says for anything dot has made it to the end, then it has something that's a completed non-terminal back because it has that at states at whatever number there. So in this case, it's completed a P. And it says at four. So we can look at states at four and see if there's anything where there's a dot before a P. Answer that in the same way that the scanner would. This can set off a chain reaction where something finishes and then it causes something else to advance, which finishes and then causes something. So combination of these is that as input comes in, spreads out to match the different possible options, and then any ends up being flows forward. And that's the main algorithm right there. Reach the end of the check if state has the dot moved start, is to say parse, all the way back to the start of the input, and you have a match. So to tie things together, um, a quick example, it's actually directly from the paper, just built by bit. So he has a grammar AE for arithmetic expressions, which is pretty similar to the one before, except instead of having an operator, separate productions for plus and times. Um, it doesn't have any numbers, it just has A, so presumably it's in hexadecimal. So it takes the input A plus A times A. Start out in state set zero with just we have a dot before an E, so we predict all of the ways we can match E. That has a dot before an E. Already added that, so then there's also a dot before a T. So we predict those. We already have t. Then we can predict a p non-terminal, and that accepts a. That's the first input token that we have. So we can add on to the next set. So then the scanner advances that over. Then because of that, we have a completed p. And back and see if there's anything else that wanted that as the next non-terminal. That advances t. And that T in turn completing advances and the other T for. So those sort of sweep forward. And that E completing advances other E variant and also completes the, the field. Which sort of also points out that if the input stopped here, it would have a full parse, because just A is a valid string in the language. But we have more, so we keep going. This, this settles down, and so we can switch over to state stat 1 that was populated. Um, and there's nothing to predict here because there's not a dot before it on terminals. So we just take the plus, that e dot plus t, and advance that. And so that goes to the next one. And we have state set 2, which is just that. There's a dot before the t, so we can predict t. This same thing happens again. And uh, also note that these have at 2, 0 after so they started matching two times in. This will be important. It's complete. It's back not to the first state set, but to this one to see if there's anything else to advance there. So then that is able to A and then advance onto the next state that uh, completes some other stuff. And now it takes the asterisk, same thing, flips forward. Then we get to the end of the input, and we check is a fee state there that's completed. So we have a full parse for it. And overall, the number of states that would happen here is pretty bounded. It's a little bit on the structure of the grammar, but it doesn't just blow up. Um, and there's some other nice properties of that that I'll
So uh, Early wraps up his original explanation with this quote. Note also that, although it did not develop this way, algorithm is, in effect, a top-down parser, which we carry along all possible parses simultaneously in such a way that we can often combine like sub-parses. This cuts down on duplication of effort, so avoids the left recursion problem. So it's building bottom up. It's guided by an overall top-down strategy, so it doesn't waste time trying to actually advance the overall goal of matching uh, grammar that you're trying to parse. And the state set-based construction also cuts down on a lot of redundant work, and it closes loops that would otherwise become infinite loops. So it's able to parse a lot of things that parsers run into problems with. And that's the main idea of it. There's a couple other implementation details. So this is just a recognizer. If we're parsing, actually what we want is a parse tree. All that really does is tell us whether we have The way that he recommends in the paper that you build a parse tree is time you complete on terminal, save a pointer, advance. If you have multiple things that advance by completing the same non-terminal, then you have multiple pointers there, and then you know that you have a couple different ways of having that part of it. Um, and I haven't used this method much. Apparently a bug. And Tomita, who did a bunch of research with GLR parsers, proved apparently give you also extra false results for certain kinds of grammars. May not be much of a problem in practice, depending on it's a pretty simple method. It's a different method that I tend to use, which I'll get to when I talk about at the end. Also, cases like this where you have you know, something that might have one option or another, maybe you actually want both. Ideally, there's a lot of common structure there that they share. Like in this case, um, there's a couple expression nodes that are blue, respectively, leaning near the other. But then the white nodes that they're building down to are all paired. If you have a bunch of layers of choices like this, you know, you have two options and two options, that, that it explodes combinatorially quickly. So in order to keep the overall space usage obtained, it's, it's good to try to share that sort of stuff. So what we want is a parse forest. What they're called. Um, I, I guess it jumps very quickly from having a tree to having a forest. I guess it's kind of like if you have two boats, like you technically have. <laughs> I don't know. Again, established terminology. Two boats. So um, another thing to keep in mind which is, is uh, implementing things. It's pretty easy to work with, but it's a thing that comes up with a lot of users is nullability. So if you have non-terminals that have a production that can just be empty, actual handling for that. Um, and what happens is adapt the complete predictor so that if they predict something, it's immediately so it doesn't actually need to consume anything. Then instead of advancing stuff into the next state set, it's at the end of the curve. Actually step over. I never remember how to do that the first time, but I remember how to write a test for it, and it's pretty easy to figure out. So um, this is an example of something that's nullable. So there's a list, and it says element and link. It's either a comma, another element, another link, or nothing. So this is kind of like the thing on the bottom, and um, more of a regular expression kind of syntax where you say, and then optional star. And this isn't very difficult to handle. It's just kind of a special case you have to watch. Paper he also uses look ahead. So he doesn't just keep track of the current token, but he keeps track of the next one. It's predicting by it and fail. Which seems like a good idea, but there's a little bit of extra book. That and literature goes back and forth. So there's been things that are more focusing on. It's a lot simpler if you just 
And a couple other things worth noting. So this is particularly useful as a parser because it's a general parser. It can handle any kind of free grammar cause other users to just sort of get stuck in its ways or I need to annual refactoring of the sort of pull some sort of version or things of a grammar has a bunch of text built into it so on. Um, two other parsing algorithms that are also of interest are GLL and GLR. So a closure library called to parse that's based on GLL that. But so the paper gives this as an example of a highly non-realistic grammar. This matches one or more x's, but it does so using left and right recursion. So it just sort of fans out in a possible combination. This is uh, something that would run in time modifications to the parser that bring it down a lot. This is also like a super contrived worst case example. Look like this. So there's an x, there's two x's, or there's three x's one way, or there's three x's the other way, or there's four, or there's five, and then it just sort of spills on down the page, pushing out. But so the real feature here is that it's a really easy write grammar working with an error. And if you're just trying to scrape some sort of data, it's like a quick experimental thing. It's a much tighter back loop there. Uh, certain other parsing tools, Mac in particular, and end up spending quite a lot of time trying to push things around and make it well. For most realistic grammars, which is something that can find a lot more precisely, but with longer talk, parser can run in linear. That's not true for parser implemented exactly as in the paper, but if you follow up things, it Higher fixed costs um, stuff would that is is sort of specifically to suit, but still things that you're like. And part of the reason why it has slightly higher constant factors is because it's actually retaining a lot of useful info. And so if you look at something like this, you know, you can see in these states, oh, it's in the middle trying to parse a class definition and there's some statements. It's in the middle of a statement. It wants a semicolon. So you sort of get a stack trace out of the parser. That can be a really valuable thing, particularly if you're trying to implement something like autocomplete, syntax highlighting, features like that where you're working directly with structure of or, or scrape, and so on. And is it's better to just have access to this info rather than throwing it away immediately as soon as possible. Also, uh, once the parser moves on, all of the original states, nothing is modified, it's just referred back to and then... That means that um, it behaves kind of like a persistent data structure. So again, if you're syntax highlighting, you have a bunch of data that's changing very rapidly, up to it isn't that processing and say okay copy reuse this now update that account for that it's, there's less latency than if you had to redo it's up to that similarly this fails got or it got stuck what it wanted there and so on copy it and try to what if scenarios so you can say if I, this particular terminal to close off is that sort of information to give helpful messages. So it's been decades of and variations published about users. It is really its own family of parts. And here's a couple particularly significant and that I'm really fond of. So um, there's this paper by Yup Yo. I hope I'm saying his name correctly. Uh, he has a really significant optimization. 
So if you have something write recursive in the basic early parser, it'll end up of states because it'll say, you know, we're matching here to here. So matching here. It gets deeper, carry along more and more stuff. Recognize that you can detect that at runtime and say, okay, we're continuing this. The amount of information that it advances is flat. Reminds me a lot of functional languages, tail call optimization. So up a call stack deeper. Thing or the other thing that the is going to do is just so then it can just work in space. This means that there's a much, much larger class of grammars, which again is, is a long, complicated thing. Basically, anything that LL or LR parser, typical grammar that you might work with in programming language. And also, the name of the paper itself is a good example of right. So, a general context free parsing algorithm, running in linear time, every LRK grammar, using look ahead. It just sort of feels like you can keep adding lines to this forever. Another one so, ACOC and Horsepool just that have the, the parser running and it's just sort of continuing those operations until it doesn't make any further progress. That's probably doing strictly necessary. And they figured out how to order all of those individual operations so that you can just do it in one pass. Part of that is doing a bit of analysis up front so it can figure out which of the non-terminals can potentially be I get sort of completes it, but also predicts it, but also predicts it in a and then that brings the overall constant factor. Elizabeth Scott and Adrian Stone have several books that they published in the last couple of years about different parsing algorithms. This is one of them about early parsers. They all use what they call a shared pack forest, which is what SPPF is, which is shared parse tree thing, with structural sharing in it. They also have similar papers on GLR and original work on GLL, which may be of interest even if you're taken with early parsing. Um, I couldn't get this working. I spent quite a while working on it, just ran into these issues, but you might. While I was struggling with that, I ran across this other paper, which tries a. And the approach was used in papers by Lang, based very heavily on some foundational results from Bar Hillel in 1961. But it wasn't until this paper by Van Nivert in 1995, this thing was actually given it, described as a separate thing, something that was sort of implicitly used in the paper. And it's something else that's really describing recursive structures. The best part of it is that it's been hiding inside all along. Grammars, specifically parse forest grammars. So to go back to this example where we have left and right leaning versions of just this expression here. There's one plus two plus three, or one plus two plus three. And the grammar that looks like this, where it's an expression, expression, operator, expression, or int. So it can decide which of those two expressions ends up having the sub addition in it, just a number. Build up a shared parse forest like this, that contains both versions. Again, those are colored to represent the two different that are in white. But we can also get back a grammar that looks like this. So this encodes the expressions and their positions in the offset, uh, in the input. Really what this is doing is sort of curve the grammar, getting back a specialized version of the grammar that would match this exact input. If you try generating every possible language based off of this grammar, you only exactly get the parse trees. And then, so uh, here you'll see expression zero through five has two reductions because that's where it's actually branching ambiguously. So it's expression zero to three, five, or it's expression zero to one, 
operator one to two, expression two to four. That's directly putting the same sort of thing. So thinking about grammars is something that could just be intersected with other input in my mind. And it's very easy to modify an early parser to make it output something like this because you're already keeping track of all the information necessary for this. You just need to save the token offsets every time you advance stuff and modify the leader so that when you're done, it saves everything and that's reachable from the start symbol that says um, production also has the positions in it. This is all based on naming and positions structural sharing for free. And also, this is great because you might not actually need the entire parse tree for things that you're doing. You want to just say, you know, does this particular construct appear between here and the source or anything? Go down into the specifics of the grammar to those things. So that is my talk. And if you want to learn more about parsing, that's visible okay. Uh, get Dick Grun's rather modestly named Sing Techniques, a Practical Guide. It's a really great survey of the field. It has a huge, well-curated bibliography with historical context and how a bunch of different publications relate to it and so on. The PDF of the first edition is free on the author's site. So that covers lots of fundamental stuff. If you find that you're really interested in it, then you have the second edition. Uh, it's really great. As interested in this stuff as I am, you can spend years in this book. So that's it. Questions? Hey, uh, mentioned intersecting the grammar with the input. Yes. Is that abstract interpretation or partial evaluation? Because it's like, you said you could take the input and generate a grammar out of it, which seems like abstract interpretation, but it's also like partial evaluation because if you get the evaluator for the grammar, then you get the input in. I, I would think of that more as partial evaluation, but I also have like a very zone appreciated appreciation of that stuff rather than using some of the terminology wrong. Um, so what it's doing is taking the grammar and some input getting a restricted version of the grammar back. I'm sure about this describes it more constraint sort of way. Like the, all of the Lang papers are very centric, so that sort of origin makes a lot of sense. It, it might just be slightly different restating of the same ideas. I, you mentioned that um, some of the rules can be run in production. Is, is, that, is that correct? Some of the productions can be run in parallel, is what I mean. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah so um, it, it is less parallel in the sense of parallelism, lots of threads, lots of cords or whatever, or that there's lots of branches that are sort of spreading out incrementally. Yeah, that was, that was my question. But like, you, so you'd still have to run it sequentially. Yeah. Are there any implementations that can take advantage of parallelism? There probably are. That's not something that I've looked into. It hasn't really mattered for the sort of things I've tried to use. Anyone else? Cool. Great. Great. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, thank you so much.